Good afternoon. I'm enjoying my donut, which isn't good because I just came from the gym and I feel like the best reward is to have a donut and I should be eating something else, but well. So good afternoon, everyone. I didn't know that tomorrow in the Philippines is going to be a holiday, which is why I was wondering that people are slowing down with their emails lately, meaning there haven't been much emails, there haven't been much chats. So I just realized it's going to be a holiday tomorrow, and I think that's the reason why people are slowing down. So how's your afternoon? I hope you're all having a great day so far. Do you also have some vacation plans for the three-day weekend? Would love to know. Let's wait for people to settle down before we start. If you also notice, today's topic is going to be different. For the past three days, we've been talking about boosting your confidence. That's your ability to improve your public speaking skills. For this afternoon, we're going to go to the written mode. So we're going to talk about being able to level up your business writing skills. So I'll be inviting all our participants to ask questions that are related to emails, to chats, to reports, to presentations, anything that requires typing, writing, anything that involves having to read your sentences. Okay? So give us an exclamation mark. By the way, just want to check your energy. Just want to check if I'm also audible, if I'm all loud and clear. Let us know your city, your province, your country. Tell us your company, your industry, your line of work, just so we get to know our participants better. So Ella says, hello. Thank you for joining our session. Karen says, need more coffee. You know, I've been drinking a lot of coffee lately, and my left lower eyelid has been twitching which means that I've been uh, drinking too much coffee already. Jur is asking, is this free? Well, did you pay anything to be able to watch this session? Uh, all live streams are for free. Uh, if you're watching that from Facebook, YouTube, or LinkedIn, they obviously are for free. Okay. Net Maranan is watching from Australia. Chin is watching from Kamsur. Karen is watching from Bulacan. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Agent Orange, is that Agent Orange from Vietnam, is watching from Cavite, working in a BPO industry. Thank you for joining us also in this session. Jan is watching from UAE. Mandan is watching from Olongapo. Thank you. So let's get the ball rolling. I want you guys, while I'm biting my another piece of my donut, I want you guys to please start typing questions about business writing. It could involve a conflict with someone. It could involve simple things such as, is it okay to say hello and hey, should I include a quote from the Bible in my email signature? Is that fine to be written? So all these things, guys, just keep on typing them. We'll also be giving away free uh, bees, meaning some prizes. Let me just fix my TikTok. If you guys have... Uh, if you guys are interested to win some prizes, we'll be giving away some tickets to our upcoming workshops on email etiquette and business writing. And as usual, we'll be giving away some 500 peso gift certificate from our sponsor, and that is Osh or Oso oh Healthy Snacks. So stay tuned. We'll be asking some questions later on. The first person who gets my question correct will be able to win. Okay. My doula is watching from Dubai. Also, hello from uh, Dang. Net says, quote from the Bible. No, I think it's okay to put some quotes from the Bible if you're working from a company that is deliberately religious. It could be a bookstore. It could be from a church, etc. But from a company perspective or a corporate perspective, it's always best to be neutral and rather be secular about it. Okay. Ronald is watching from Muntinlupa from LinkedIn. Mon is watching from Facebook from Asian Land Strategies. He's from the employee engagement. Uh, he's the head of employee engagement in Malolos, Bulacan. Thank you for staying tuned with us. Okay. Let's look at some more folks here. 
Oh, someone here says, I had the privilege to work with you before when you were still with GlaxoSmithKline. Which department? Because I came from marketing. I spent four years of my career in GSK. Learned a lot of things about it. Uh, specifically about leadership. Because when you're from the marketing team, even if you have to create marketing materials like detail aids for doctors or posters, you have to win the hearts of the sales force who are scattered all around the Philippines. And they see you as your support so that they can get their job done. Okay. Uh, insider information, I hated my job in the first three months. In fact, I wanted to quit my job because I came from Globe Telecom before I transferred to the pharmaceutical industry, in this case, GlaxoSmithKline. And I was more excited about, ooh, my poster and billboard is up on EDSA. Ooh, my TV commercial is visible on ABS, CBN, or GMA. And then when I transferred to the pharmaceutical industry, we were not allowed to post these things because we can only advertise directly to doctors, not to patients. So I felt that my job was less glamorous. I hated it. And then as the months went by, I appreciated more that this job is teaching me how to win the hearts of people even if I don't like them or even if I have to build relationships with them. I had to build relationships with doctors. I had to build relationships with lawyers. I had to build relationships with uh, the procurement team, for example. And I think that the leader who I am today is because of all those hardships I had to go through. Why am I sharing this? I think the moral lesson here is sometimes if you don't like your job in the first two months or three months, you need to float it a bit more. You have to give it more time. You have to be fair to the company and to yourself because sometimes you may have entered the company at the wrong time. But after a few weeks or after a few months, things will definitely change or your perspective might also change. It was actually worth staying in the company. And it could have been the best time of your life. So props to, you know, the pharmaceutical industry remains to be my favorite industry of all time. So many learnings. It's also one of the most generous industries, by the way. If you happen to have worked in the pharma industry, you get a car because it's needed for work. Uh, there are always a lot of events that involves food. A lot of the scientific events happen in hotels because you have to make the environment conducive for learning. And so I enjoy that part. Lots of traveling, by the way. My first ever trip to Europe, I was 24 years old. And this was in Italy. This was in Torino, which was the northern part, which hosted, the, I think, the 1990, 2004 something, uh, Winter Olympics. And then it was my first ever trip to places like, so I went to Rome and I went to Paris and I went to Madrid all by myself for two weeks. I, I know it's wrong to rush all of those cities in two weeks, but I was 24 years old and I, was, I felt I was living the life because I was able to go to these places as early as I can and because the company sent me to a place and my boss allowed me to do a quick, uh, a two-week vacation. So I owe so much to, to GSK, to my company. Okay, Albert is watching from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. Uh, Tina says, we all had a great time in GSK. You know, yes, I think, uh, well, GSK is kind of smaller now. Uh, the business has been quite relatively smaller. It has shrunk. But I think during that time in 2010 to 2016, it was the golden age. Okay, enough of Jonathan. We're going to be answering your questions now about email chats, etc. Okay. There's a comment here from Francis that says, I honestly do not read emails. That is more than a paragraph. Uh, there is a kernel of truth that I would agree to this. It's called TLDR, too long did not read. If your email is too long, it will disengage your audience to the point that even if the person is supposed to read the entire email, their interest goes down that they will miss out on certain parts of your email, that they will misread certain parts of your email. So the quicker you're able to finish an email, bullet points, tables, quick lines, if you can, execute your emails that way. You don't need to write as if you're writing a memorandum 
in a local government unit the way Philippine agencies do it, for example. So yes, I agree. Shorter the better without compromising the quality and without taking away the relationship that you need to establish. Because if you're talking to someone for the first time on email, sometimes you still have to put some formality. You have to address with proper salutations. You have to do proper introductions. I think you should add a lot of website links or attach a brochure if you're introducing your company in the, for, in, uh, for the first time. But if you have been talking to this person for quite a while, you've been intimate in your relationships because you've been working with each other for five years or 10 years, I don't think you need to have that formality. You can skip that formality. Okay. Brevity is the soul of the wit. That is my favorite quote. And there's this line from Tom, uh, from Charles Dickens. I am sorry that it took me a while to write my email because it took me time to shorten it. Because it takes time. It's fast. It's easier to write a long email. It's harder to write a short email because you have to edit it multiple times. Because our tendency is to be very verbose. No? Ooh, there's this comment here from Eya Kobayashi and says, I almost resigned on my third month as well on my current job. I already had a start date with another company, but I decided to stay and try to work it out for one month. And now I'm on my eighth year or eighth month and excelling. I'm glad I stayed. Okay, So that's a good in example. Again, I'm not here to say that you have to keep on pushing the envelope. You have to keep on pushing your patience. If you really think that it's not worth pursuing after two months or three months because the worst things happen to you, then go. But I don't think you should make that immediate decision when you have not given yourself proper exposure. Exposure to the people, exposure to the processes, exposure to other departments. It's just like dating. Are you really going to ditch someone when the person has a few promises but has a few imperfections? And what can you do to think beyond those imperfections, realizing that there are other things to appreciate about this person? I think the same thing also happens to building relationships with companies. Okay? Okay. I have a question here on YouTube. Okay, question here is, John, when I am looping out someone in an email, do I really need to inform everyone that I am taking out that person from the email? Yes, I think you should. It's a polite way of doing so. Plus, there is a functional reason. When you are looping out a person, there has to be a reason why. Is it because you're going to share confidential information later on? Is it because you are mad at this person? The other people need to know because if they're also sharing information, they were assuming all these times that this person was in the loop. And if they were taken out prematurely, then they were wasting their time typing and sending those information. It's also the same thing when you're looping in someone in an email. Please do not loop in someone without informing others. The others need to know because maybe this person must not be in this email thread. Maybe this person is a threat to the conversation because the conversation is confidential. So you need to inform everyone if you are looping in or looping out someone from an email thread. Otherwise, your intentions may be questioned. Okay? Can I get an exclamation mark, by the way, in the chat box if we're in sync with that? By the way, I haven't asked the participants if it's your first time to join us. Would you could you please give us a like or give us a heart? We will appreciate that. That's the only thing we will request from you. It will help us improve our algorithm so we can reach more people. By the way. There you go. Very good. Okay, let me cover this. Um Mon says. After a while, only basic emojis are accepted. Hashtags should be a maximum of, th of three. Speaking of emojis, John, is it okay to include emojis in your emails or your chats? Chats are easily forgivable because most of us already put emojis in our chats. But what about for emails? I think it's okay to use it if you have established relationships also with this person. When the person already knows you, 
They can hear your voice while they're reading your email. You've been through a numerous amount of projects. So they can understand what is the intention behind that emoji. If you have not yet built a relationship with this person, you're talking to them for the first time, it's a possible client, it's a possible agency, I think you should refrain from adding emojis for two reasons. Number one, some people see it as a sign of immaturity that you're just playing along with your conversation. Number two, not everyone is aware of the universal definitions of smileys. Case in point, there are certain cultures like in Europe, and I've experienced this many times, when you put a smiley, some of them will think that you are flirting instead with them. And so this might change the way they perceive you, and this might also lessen your credibility, especially if you want to achieve command in your conversations. So... I prefer not to put my emojis, okay? Same thing, let's not be judgmental of people. So, for example, in the Philippines, can I, just, can I just raise this? I hate it when people expect you to put an emoji when you are requesting a favor from them. Like, you have to put a smiley. You have to put the pray, praying position or thankful position if you're asking for a request because it makes you look that you're gentle. I disagree with this. When I'm requesting something from you, it's because it's part of our business transaction. I should not look like I'm begging it or I'm desperate to ask it from you. And if I did not include it, it's not because I'm a bad person. It's simply because I'm efficient. I don't think that an emoji is needed for you to get the job done. Okay. Net Maranan says here, uh, yeah, emoji is okay for really close circle colleagues. To outside organization emails, I rarely use it and it's not preferable. Let's answer a non-business writing related question. The question here is, hi, John, how do you ask for a salary increase to your supervisor? I always get this question, by the way. How do you ask for a salary raise increase to your supervisor or manager if you have been in the company for more than a year? Okay, again, let me remind and repeat what are the general rules for asking for a salary raise. Number one, we ask for a raise because it's something that we deserve based on merit or based on a technicality such as cost of living or changes in the economy. I do think that increase of salary in just one year or two years is too quick. Most companies do not even allow that to happen. And I always say, do not use the reason that, you know, ang anak ko po buntis or ang asawa ko po nagkasakit. All of these things, we would love to help you out. But the solution to that is not increasing your salary. And neither should the company give you an exclusive benefit without doing the same thing to other employees. So you can't expect that only you will get the salary increase and others won't. If you're asking for a salary raise, you always have to Consider number one, is it because I am doing beyond my scope of work? Meaning, four of your colleagues resigned, they were all dumped into you. That's fair. I think you should get a salary increase because you're doing beyond your capacity. If the industry has experienced a change in salary levels, meaning you, the company has found out that other companies are giving more competitive salaries, the PPO industry, for example, is an example of um, is an example of that. Then I think the company can initiate a salary increase. If the cost of living and the mandatory national minimum wage has been changed based on regular based on regulation, then the company can also do that. But in most situations, it's hard to request for a salary increase if it's just a matter of wanting it or needing it. It has to be based on merit. Okay, Ra Raynell from LinkedIn is asking this question. Would you recommend intentionally making a few spelling errors to make the reader think that it's composed of a real human, not a robot? I, no, not at all. I don't think we already live in a time wherein when you send an email, people think that your email is done by a chatbot, right? I think most people would still think that it's a real person talking to them. Plus, at the same time, 
any simple error is a judgment that you do not care enough on what you're typing. So it lowers your credibility. So I strongly discourage you to make those spelling errors. Okay? And by the way, having a perfectly spelled email is not impossible. It's normal, right? I think a lot of people can do that easily. Shili is asking from YouTube, what is the best signature that is formal? Is it regards, sincerely, etc.? I don't have I'm I'm indifferent to ask to answering this question. I I often used sincerely. I also used the word thanks. I don't think that this is the biggest issue to consider when writing an email. In fact, most people skip this part. So if it's all about making an impression, focus on the content of your main email, not on the signature. Sincerely is fine. Regards is fine. Best regards is fine. This is me, if, this is me joking. If you write regards, I have an idea how old you are. Because usually that's what Generation X would say. Okay? Generation Y or Z would write thanks most of the time. Okay. Chari Galliano from Facebook is asking this question. Oh, people are typing in TikTok. John, you're not answering our questions here. Let me answer your questions in a while on TikTok, but let me answer first this one. John, how do you politely decline additional tasks that you think you are skilled enough? I don't get this part. Why are you declining something when you're already skilled for it? Or are you saying that you're declining a task that you're too good to do it? Okay, Chari, can you please clarify this? But regardless, if it's all about declining a specific task, for whatever reason it is, you have to have a good reason. And the reason is not about complaining because you don't want additional work. Compl uh, if you're going to challenge, challenge based on fairness, Challenge based on what's best for the company. Best for the company meaning, if you keep on dumping me additional work, I will not be able to focus on projects X, Y, and Z, which will compromise the quality of the output in the future. Okay? Okay, let me answer now TikTok questions because I have been forgetting this part. Someone's asking, Karen, 0920, how do you kindly say no to a senior colleague who always asks you to do their own tasks? I've done a lot of uh, videos on this. I've even posted one on TikTok. But two quick tips. Number one, whenever the person asks this from you, and if the opportunity knocks that they ask it publicly, decline also publicly. So if it's in the middle, let's say, it's during a meeting, or there are other people who are also listening. I will use an opportunity to decline and say, I would love to help you out, but my plate is also full. I need to accomplish A, B, and C. After I finish them, let me get back to you and see if I can help. So this is a polite way of, I wish I can help, but I don't want to help without saying it, if you get what I mean. I hope you, you get that part, right? The number two, in order for me to decline, one way is to loop in my manager by saying, ah, okay, I understand that you need help on X, Y, and Z. Can I loop in our boss? Because I want her to know what exactly am I working on on top of my other deliverables. Usually, when you involve your manager by simply saying that you're going to tell this to them, that bully, that senior colleague, will start realizing, oh, I don't want the boss to find out about this because I'm supposed to be the one doing it. Of course, when you say this, you're saying it in a casual manner, but deep inside, you're threatening the other person. It's implying, ah, you're asking me to do things that you're supposed to be the one accomplishing. Let me loop in my manager. Not because he knows some kita, but because I want my manager to know what is my workload. And I want her to be aware that if I'm not able to accomplish the other tasks, it was because you added that additional task on my plate. So you see how the politics works? It is said in a casual and friendly manner, but there's an implicit message that they will realize later on. Okay? I hope I was able to answer your question. Uh, Mick saying, cheers is my signature. That's also fine. 
By the way, cheers is a very specific word that's used in Australia, Scotland, UK. And I didn't know, maybe only until five years ago, that when they say the word cheers, it also means thank you. Cheers kasi in the Philippines or in Asia, we use cheers to like, you know, cheers as in we toast glasses. Cheers in other countries, such as in Britain or New Zealand as well, it means thank you. So when you've done something to someone, they'll say, ah, cheers, mate. So be careful about that because there's a different context of conversation. And that's why you include the word cheers in the email because what you're implying is thank you. Okay, here's a question from LinkedIn. Okay, when a boss is exposing you little by little on a meeting with top management to present your project, is it a sign that the employee might get a pretty good appraisal at the end of the year? It is a possible sign, but it's not a guarantee. So what does Jewelson mean here? So for example, your manager asks you, John, Gawin mo nga yung slide number one, make some slides number one to number five, and then we will present it to management. Most of the time, leaders will only present everything on their own. But when the manager also gives you an opportunity to take the stage and present one or two slides, it is a sign of number one, they're starting to trust you that you can do this on your own. Number two, it's also a way of exposing you to the other leaders and say, oh, look at Jonathan, look at Joelson. He's doing a good job, right? He can present on his own. That's because he's been coached well for the past few months. This is important because usually in order for someone to get promoted after one year or two years, most of the promotion discussions are done based on anecdotes. It's when, ah, See, Jewelson, yeah, I remember that guy. He was that guy in that meeting. Di ba galing niya present He was able to answer all the questions correctly. So those things usually happen. When your manager allows you to be exposed to other vice presidents or senior leaders, it means possibly that you will be a candidate for promotion in the future. However, it is not a guarantee. They might be eyeing on you, but it can take five more years Four more years. It probably is just a start of the journey, right? But it is a sign because I'd rather have a boss who starts to expose me to other senior leaders than a boss who just treats me like a secretary or an assistant. Okay? I'd rather have that. Ooh, here's one more. Same question also from Jewelson. Jewelson is asking, when I say I'm busy, or I'm loaded, or I'm tied up with an issue or meeting? Is it a professional way of getting away with a colleague that doesn't want to work with you? Possible, but not all the time. I do think that there are better ways to dismiss someone. And you can say, John, I'm, I would say I'm currently engaged on this project. Okay, Rather than saying I'm busy, because the word busy implies I do not want to make time for you. Okay? So yes, it's possible that this person is avoiding you, but it's also possible that this person is just genuinely busy and they don't know how to say it politely. <laughs> They're just blunt. They just don't know how to use better words for it. Okay? Shelly from YouTube is asking, how do you write emails that will make people act on it as up? Like if you are requesting something. Well, first and foremost, if you do not have a good subject for your email, they will not even open it. If you have a very long subject or if your subject is so vague. So for example, you use the word Project Jonathan. There are other employees in the company who are also working on Project Jonathan or whatever name of the project is. If you're going to use that, you're competing for attention with other employees sending a similar email with that same name. So there's going to be a lower chance that they will even open your email. Remember, subjects, subject lines are like the advertisements. It is the litmus test to finding out if this person wants to open your email. That's one. Number two, most of us forget this. 
people are not going to act on your email if you're not clear with the reason why it's important to do it. And number two, when is the deadline? You know my biggest pet peeve? People who send instructions on emails but have zero information on when should I submit it. Is it tonight? Is it tomorrow? Is it next week? You're even burdening me to be the one to ask on email, okay, noted, when do you need this? And that for me is very inconsiderate of others. If you indicate why is it needed tonight and what time is it needed tonight, most people will try to deliberate acting on your project. Okay, another question from LinkedIn from Christopher Ceresa. Hi, John. Is it generally accepted to acknowledge on the team leader's email, including everyone in the original distribution list? Is it generally accepted to acknowledge on the team leader's? Sorry, I don't get this part. Christopher, can you be more specific? What exactly are you acknowledging? Do you mean the presence? Are you acknowledging? Can you specify? I may not have understood what this, what, what this question is. So please get back to me. I'll give you a few seconds to uh, type that. In the meantime, let's cover some questions on TikTok. Agent Orange is asking on TikTok, is it okay to apply to a higher position without telling your direct leader? I don't think you should even ask permission. If you think that a certain position is going to make you a better person, a happier person, a well-rounded person, by all means, apply to any company that you want. Even if you may be leaving behind work, that's the problem of the company. I will be blunt about it. As long as you properly turn over your work, as long as you're not criminally liable for anything, as long as you're not offending anyone, I think it's totally fine to take good care of your career. And that includes applying for a position that you know that you can afford to apply for. You're worthy of applying for it. You have been trained enough to apply for it, etc. Ranel on Gmail, is it, is it okay to collect emails in Google and send an email blast? The Philippine data privacy law states that when you are sending an email to someone, it should be based on consent. So no. You know, I mean, in real life, it's not like someone's going to file a lawsuit against you that you are spamming because it's not worth the effort and the cost. But technically speaking, you're not supposed to get a random set of emails from one person. So those people who are selling a set of emails from you, you can buy them in the black market. But technically, you are against the law if you're using those emails and sending them promotional emails because there was no consent in the first place. Another example, let's say you have a friend from Jollibee. And Jollibee, let's say, has a lot of email addresses of their past customers who purchased online. And then your friend says, oh, you know, I'm the one who's working on the emails. I can give you a copy of all those email addresses so you can use them to send and promote your own products. That's against the data privacy law. Okay? Because the email addresses were only collected by Jollibee, for the main purpose that there was consent, it was because the person ticked the box that says, I am willing to accept emails from Jollibee, including promotional emails, etc. So they were aware of the reasons why they were being sent. In your case, it was a different company, it's a different product, it's a different intention. So be mindful about that part, okay? So Renel, don't. You can technically, okay, you can... But be mindful because even if, unfortunately, the execution of law in the Philippines is not as tight, there will be days na kapag minalas ka lang talaga at ikaw ang pinag-initan, right? You might not be in a good position for doing it. Okay. Also, by the way, also part of the Data Privacy Act of the Philippines, if you are sending an email blast to a group of customers, you have to make sure that the last part of the email has a button that allows unsubscription. 
Okay? So we do this. So we do a lot. We do send a lot of emails to our uh, email blast recipients. So there has to be a button because that means you're allowing them to opt out if they don't want to continue receiving emails anymore. Of course, these guys can do whatever they want. They can always click the block button or spam button. That's also another way. Okay, from LinkedIn, Jettison is asking, when you are resigning and your current employer is trying to do a counter offer relative to the new job description from the other company you're applying for, is it appropriate to provide your employer a copy of your signed JO for their deliberation or better tell them with a ballpark figure? Uh, two things. Number one, I discourage you from doing that because that is a confidential piece of information from the other company. Okay? Likely they are competitors. And this is confidential information. You're not supposed to be sharing with your other employer. So be mindful about that. That can turn into an ugly lawsuit from the other company. Okay? That's one. Number two, I think from an from a selfish perspective, if you actually give the exact piece of paper, you're not giving yourself elbow to negotiate. Because you're telling them everything. Right? You can jack up. I mean, if I'm going to be smart about this, I can jack up and say, I'm sorry, the other company does not allow me to share that sheet of paper, but I can give you a range. And I can increase the range so that if you're really keen to get that counter offer, you can increase further your salary. Just make sure that you work hard when you go back to that same company. Right? But I think more than anything else, be careful because that is a confidential. I, if I was the owner of a competitor company, I don't like it when my competitor finds out how much am I offering to my to the other talents that you are poaching from me. Okay, so be careful. A range will always be good. And I need to highlight this for everyone. When a recruiter is asking for your exact salary during your job interview, you have all the rights to decline and say, I don't feel comfortable sharing that information more so because I also think that it's confidential information by the company I'm working for because that is intelligent. That is competitive intelligence about how they treat their employees. What I can give you, however, is a ballpark estimate. This is important so that you can increase the ballpark estimate if you're applying for a 20 to 30% increase. Okay. By the way, it's also a red flag. For me, this is a red flag. Huh? If the HR recruiter is asking for your salary, exact salary or payslip, I will have an automatic conclusion that is a very backward company. It's a company that thinks that your value is based on your last company's performance. It's a company that is lazy to assess you properly and evaluate you properly, that the only way to determine your salary is to base it from your last month's payslip. That's lazy. That is absence of due diligence. And simply put, it's just lack of creativity, lack of excitement in your job as well. Okay, uh, let's look at some more questions here. By the way, can I just make a disclaimer? When you're giving a higher range, be prepared to defend it. Because if you are successfully able to get that higher range during negotiation and you start slacking off during your job, I'll be that HR who says, this guy lied. This guy does not deserve the salary that was given to him. And they're going to eye on you in the future round of retrenchment or redundation if there is such a word, they will eye on you. Okay, so you know it's good to ask for a higher appraisal, but also be fair to the company and be fair to yourself. Okay, Leo is asking this from Facebook. Some companies will ask for a copy of your previous payslip. Is it legal? Unfortunately, there is no civil or criminal issue for this. It's and at the end of the day, it's a private transaction. So they can, right? They can. However, I, based on my principles, I will not give my payslip. And I will say, I'd like to adhere to my principles. And I 
feel uncomfortable doing that because I do think that the value of my job is not based on my last month's payslip. It's based on the new perspectives that I can offer to you as a company. Meaning, you're getting someone outside the company rather than hiring someone internally because you embrace the fact that you can get a fresher set of perspectives, a new set of networks, a new set of uh, vendors and agencies from my network because you're getting, me some, you're getting me from the outside. That has a premium. And that's the reason why I don't think I should be paid the same amount or close to the same amount that I was getting in my last company. Okay. Okay. Mary Jean, sorry, Mary Jean, let me read your email because you have been, you've been typing this. I have a master's degree, but not enough work experience just at the bank as a staff position. Can I apply as a manager? Of course, yes, technically you can. But remember that managerial positions are not just assessed even if you have a PhD degree. It's based on experience because nothing can replace leadership skills but exposure to people in the past. This is the reason also why I am a big believer that when you want to pursue taking up an MBA or a master's degree, it's best to take it, okay? Not required, but it's best to take it after you have gained work experience. Why? Learning is kinesthetic. You will only appreciate the concepts on the PowerPoint slides if you can connect it to things that you have learned in the past in real life. If you take up an MBA and you keep on, you know, you're good in computing the percentage, you're good in computing the profit, but you don't know the real problems that happen in the real world, I don't think you're going to be a good businessman as well. Okay? So yes, you can apply, but don't take it personally if they disregard it your MBA or your master's degree. Because for most positions, it might, it's not the critical driver for acceptance for the role. Okay? Okay. EJ Manalansan from TikTok is asking, is 30% increase in moving to another company good enough? Yes, I do think so. Most companies will only regard you to 10 to 15%. 20 to 30% is relatively generous. Again, mathematically, this will depend on the absolute value. 30% of 1 million peso is too high, so it doesn't happen often. Usually, that increment is going to be 2% or 5% because the absolute value of 1 million is high. But 30% of 100,000 is fair enough because that's 30,000 out of the 100,000. That's usually what you get if you move to a different company for an associate position or a pre-managerial role. <laughs> My dog is... John, Tanjiro, come here. He's barking loud now. Okay. Let's look for one more. Ooh, I like this question from TikTok. What is your opinion about employees using AI tools for work? Is it gaining traction here in the Philippines? Not much yet. I do think it's dependent on the industry. So I think in the creatives industry, I think in the BPO industry, AI is definitely getting a lot of traction because there's immediate benefit to using it. I don't mind if my people are able to use AI. However, I also do think that there has to be a level of fairness. So if it's all about being able to write a proper email using AI so that they can clean up their grammar, Grammarly, for example, has been here for almost a decade now, and it's AI. Most people forget that. It's an AI-driven tool. I don't mind. But I want them to also understand the reason why there were mistakes corrected by Grammarly. Right? I don't mind, for example, if in order to craft a video, you had to use an AI tool. I don't mind. As long as the shortcuts lead to them being able to use the save time for something else. I think that's the more I think that should be the benefit reach. It should not be an excuse that just because I was able to finish my job quickly because of AI, I can now slack off with my job. Right? And I will no longer appreciate the concept of extra touches to customer service.
Ooh, at Neil is asking from YouTube, is it okay to remove carbon copied people? I mentioned this a while ago. If you need to and if you have to, you have to justify to the rest of the audience members reading the email, why did you take this person out? Okay, yeah, there has to be a justification. Okay, let's read some more questions here. Renz, JLo, as a manager, are you really required to pay for the trainings you have not taken when you resign? Bond issues. Um, I have never heard of this. And if someone does this to me, I will call it out. I do understand that there are certain companies we're in you sign into a contract that when the company gave you a free certification course, let's say the certification course is for uh, Six Sigma, which could be, let's say, 10,000 pesos or 20,000 pesos. And the contract says, if you leave the company immediately in the next two years, you have to be the one to pay back for that bond. Okay? So that's fair. Okay, are we back? Let's just see. Any tips for young managers? Says, hey, Carniv, um, have this mantra that my way isn't the only way. That even if you think that there is only one way of doing things, you have to celebrate that one of your direct reports has another style of doing it. As long as they're meeting the bottom line, as long as they're not hurting anyone, let them be. As long as they are aware of the guidelines, let them be. Okay, here's one more. By the way, can I just request folks on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, give me an exclamation mark. Just want to check if you can now hear me loud and clear because I was, I got disconnected for a few seconds. Okay. Let me answer this question now from Art Neil again on YouTube. Is it okay to not to choose to immediately reply to your manager's messages if it's after work or rest day? This is a tricky question because it involves politics and relationship. Meaning, if you have not yet established relationship with your manager, meaning you've only been working with them for a few days or a few weeks, I think it's time to make a good impression first, which means that if they're asking for something way beyond 6 p.m., I would probably request, I would probably do a little bit of the work. And then afterwards, I will request and push back and say, 
is it possible to get back to you on this tomorrow? Right? Or I am currently engaged for dinner with my family. Is it possible to get back to you on this tomorrow? Right? When I say not immediately reply, it may mean ignoring the email or ignoring the message. So sometimes you may want to let them know that I received your email. I got, I, I've taken note of it, but because it's already out of, it's beyond dinner time or it's on the weekend, let me respond to this next week. Because most managers, if they really want to push it, they will ask you to get it done immediately. And remember, huh, some managers will give you projects or tasks not because they want to do it immediately in the next two hours. They're saying it to you because they might forget about it. So do not be pressured all the time that you have to work on that project as well. Sometimes you have to be bold and brave and tell the manager, noted on this, do you need this now? Or can I first prioritize the other items that I need to accomplish? I do that to my managers. Because your managers are also, they're humans. They will not remember everything that you're accomplishing or you're doing. So you have to remind them of your own plate as well. What is your take on being a micromanager? Here is a question from Dares. Two things. I think at the beginning of someone's career, when you're still hand-holding, mentoring, and coaching them, micromanaging is a good thing. I will not call it as micromanaging. I will call it as hand-holding. But when the person has finally proven that they can get the job done after a few months or after a year, you have to let them go. Because one of the primary motivators for any employee is autonomy. The ability to get things done using their own uh, style, using their own ways of doing things. Okay, let's look at some more answers. Let's, uh, we're nearing our first hour now. Let's go, is it okay if I can give away some prizes now? Can I get the letter R in the chat box if you're cool with that? So I'll be giving away some tickets to our upcoming workshop. This is on April 29, speaking of email etiquette and business writing, I want to give away two tickets to our upcoming workshop. This is at the SMX Convention Center in SM Fort BGC in SM Aura. All you need to do is to answer my question. And if you get this right, I'll give you a ticket. Okay. All cool. Yes. Okay. So I'll be asking a question now. Uh, I love trivia questions. So we're going to be asking a question that will test your memory. Maybe about, is it about your childhood or anything else? Let me think of a quick question now. Okay. So here's my question. We'll be giving away one ticket for YouTube, for LinkedIn, for Facebook, and for TikTok. Because we have a lot of viewers on TikTok, I will choose two winners instead. Is that okay? Here's a tip. We don't have much viewers on YouTube. So if you want to win, a higher chance of winning is to answer this on YouTube instead. Okay? All good? Yes. All right. So here's my question. We're, the trivia is about words. What is the first animal that you can see in the dictionary? What is the first animal that you can see in the dictionary? Okay, I'll give you a few seconds. We'll give one winner each in each platform. On TikTok, we'll give two winners. What is the first word that you can see in the dictionary? Wow, you guys are fast. The correct answer, ladies and gentlemen, is a aardvark. You can Google that, by the way. It's an aardvark. So it's like a reptile. Um, and my winner, ladies and gentlemen, the name is Giovanite on TikTok. Giovanite on TikTok. My second winner is Lavender, also on TikTok. Congratulations. So you each get one ticket to our upcoming workshop, Email Etiquette and Business Writing, on April 29. That is 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock p.m. Okay? I am showing the... On Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, I'll be able to show here the... There you go. I'm showing here the poster. That's April 29, 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. The ticket is worth 1,799 pesos, but I'll give you guys free ticket. Congratulations. 
Let me call out now the winner on Facebook. My winner, correct spelling dapat ha. I cannot call out folks who are giving the wrong spelling. My winner, ladies and gentlemen, on YouTube first. My winner on YouTube is Chari Galliano. Congratulations. My winner on Facebook is Mary Grace Ramos. And my winner on LinkedIn is Ranel Gomez. Congratulations. So, all of our winners, please send me a private message and we will give you instructions on how to claim your prize. I hope I get to see you face-to-face on our session, Email Etiquette and Business Writing at the SMX Convention Center in SM Aura, Fort BGC. April 29, 2 to 5 o'clock p.m. If you'd like to get tickets, we'd love to have you as well. Uh, we're going to have it. Uh, the tickets are available at jonathanyabut.com. Okay. All right. Let's capture some more questions from our participants. Let's see if we can. Uh, I think we can spare three to four more questions before we end the session. Oh, aardvark is a mammal, not a reptile. Thank you for correcting me. Let me see again what, how does an aardvark look like. And then I'll show to you guys. Ayan, oo nga. You know why I said it's a reptile? Because it looks like the armadillo. The aardvark, by the way, is an anteater also. So it looks like this, oh. Yan, looks like that. So it loves going into anthills. And then in, parang... The long nose just like siphons everything. Thank you for thank you for typing that in the chat box, by the way. Ayan. Okay. Let's look for some more questions. Okay, someone's asking here. This was a classic question. Lots of way of answering this, but let me answer this now. How do you handle a personnel that are not able to retain or follow simple instructions? A lot of things. Number one, how was the training? Sometimes you often think that it's so simple, but that's because you are smart. They're not. Sometimes you think it's so basic, but that's because you're the manager and you've been doing this for many years. They're not. And so when you put yourselves into their shoes, you have to identify what could be stopping them from getting it done. So extra training, extra one-on-one -on -one conversations. Usually as leaders and managers, we often think, I don't have time for that. They were already hired. They're getting paid for it. But your goal is not just to instruct. Your goal is to coach and to mentor. You have to embrace that as part of their responsibility, as part of the time. Okay? Okay. Uh, some people are telling me I answered the, I, I answered first correctly. I'm sorry, but I'm only checking the first ones that come out of my chat box. So it could be a difference in the timing. Okay. How do I deal with a missing in action manager? Okay, have you ever talked to the manager? And have you ever talked to the boss of the boss or to the boss of your manager? That includes HR. Usually when someone's MIA, it is already out of your control. It is something that someone from the management should be controlling. And usually that also includes their boss. Aardvark is not an animal. It's an avatar. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, how do you work with nosy people? I just let them be. It's not my problem if they're so interested with my life. And as long as they're not spreading rumors about me, I will let them be. But if they do spread rumors, I will call them out. I will confront them. And I will even tell them that these things are not only damaging to the morale of the team, it's spreading lies. It's not something that I was raised for by my mother. I will have that conversation with this person. Okay, someone's asking, John, what about the price for the 500 peso gift certificate? We're going to give that in a while, okay, as we end. We're going to be ending in 15 minutes at 7 o'clock. So please wait for that. Stay tuned. Okay, from Jewel sounds very active on comment section now. So let me answer this. John, another question. I need your comment. Do the HR folks nowadays... Are they naturally liars? Are they trained to do it so that they can protect the interests of the business? 
Not sure, but I notice it based from my friends' stories during our coffee dates. I think that the higher your position is in the company, you have more vested interest to protect the company. So white lies and black lies are going to be there. I don't think that there is a way for us, however, to measure that all of HR folks are like that. Because I do have lots of HR friends who will always put integrity first before the interest of the company. And that's totally fine. So maybe this is just a random sample bias. It does not represent all of the HR folks. I do think that you just happen to be exposed to people who have these experiences. Okay. By the way, important yan ha? The random sample bias is when the people that you are referring to as the generalization of your experience is not representative of the total population. So for example, pumasok ka sa office and you started taking the train, you saw four or five people who are wearing polka dots and you're taking the train to Makati and you say, why is everyone wearing polka dots today? That is only specifically to that area of the city, maybe to Makati, but it does not reflect what's in Pasig, what's in Mandaluyong, etc. Okay? But we start thinking everyone is doing it. Okay? That's a random sample bias. Okay. Shilly is asking, how do you write a resignation letter for reasons of career growth? First and foremost, let me correct that. You do not need to write whatever reason it is for resigning. Please remember that. You are not obliged, neither should you make yourself feel responsible that you have to indicate a reason for it. Because resignations, as I always say this, is an FYI. FYI, I am resigning. You are not asking for permission. So they don't need to know. If you really need to put it, it's optional. It's out of your courtesy. It's out of your wanting them to know why are you leaving the company. But you don't need to. When I write a resignation letter, I will simply say, uh, effective on October, et cetera, et cetera, I am resigning from my position. And then I can put some palabok words just to make it nice and rosy. And I will say, I thank the company for the opportunities and I thank my boss, et cetera, et cetera. That's it. Okay? You don't need to tell them what you're doing. Okay, question from YouTube from MD. Working in a diverse culture abroad, I have encountered office politics where I was made a scapegoat and subjected to bullying. I am contemplating whether it would be best to report this issue to HR. Yes, I think. I don't think there's any reason for you to keep this to yourself, especially if it is destroying your inner peace. Just be mindful of who are the allies of HR. Because if your HR is also part of the same team who's subjecting you to bullying, I don't think that there's, only, there's any easy way out. Okay, I think that you should raise this not to HR, but to another senior leader in the company who has the power to turn things around and who will be willing to be fair to all parties concerned. Because let's face it, guys, some HR folks can also be privy to other issues and they might be biased to other folks. Okay, tips on writing cover letters. Do, do cover letters still exist? This is just me, but I'm judgmental. If a company requires a cover letter in 2023, I think it's a very traditional and backward company. Because I, I don't need to express how passionate I am. And neither should you be judging how passionate an, an applicant is because they wrote a cover letter. In the time of AI, anyone can write a cover letter. So I rather should focus on what happens during the job interview and also what's in the resume than in the cover letter. I totally get it. Cover letters are summaries. I get that part. But why are you doing something redundant when that is going to be indicated in the resume anyway? And if you're really a good recruiter, it should be easy for you to scan and skim resumes without the requirement of a cover letter. Okay? Ayan, we have lots of questions now on TikTok. Let's answer this question. How do you handle people who feel so superior, but you're just in the same level with them? I just shrug my 
I just shrug my shoulders and say, Bala ka dyan. As long as this person is not affecting my performance, as long as this person is not doing anything criminally liable or offending to me, I'll just let them be. There are other dragons to slay in your life. There are other Netflix shows to binge. There are so many cities and countries to travel. Focus your attention on that. Okay? If you're letting this person rent space in your head because you think about them too much, ikaw ang talo. Okay? Okay. Let's look at... Any tips on handling personnel that are always making up excuses whenever they fail to deliver? I will give them an ultimatum. If the person has done it once, I will ensure that coaching and training happens. If the person has done it twice, I will repeat and reconsider the way I coach. If the person has done it three times or four times, that's when I will share my observations and say, John, I have noticed we have been doing this repeatedly for the X time, but I have not been seeing progress. Can we make a commitment that after the fourth or fifth attempt, you will be able to get this right? Otherwise, I have no other choice but to impose on you a imp performance improvement plan. I have no choice but to reconsider that your regularization after the six months might not happen at all. The reason why a lot of people are complacent with their underperformance is because the consequences are not clear to them. Sometimes you have to be the one to make them visualize what those consequences are. Okay, And of course, we do not motivate people just because there's a penalty. We also motivate people more powerfully because there is an incentive behind it. Okay, What can I get after? Is it commission? Is it promotion? Is it increasing your salary? Is it just the mere fact that you will be considered with good reputation in the company because you're performing well? All these things. Mary Grace, where can I message you about the free ticket? Send us a private message for whatever platform you want it. Okay? Other, right? Because Mary Grace, there's no other way. I will not give you my physical address for you to knock on my door. You're talking, me, you're talking to me on Facebook, so send us a message on Facebook. Ooh, okay. Classic question. Let me answer this. Hi, John. During interviews for a job, will there be disadvantage to mention that you're looking for a new job because you lost your current job due a, a redundancy. Not at all. The reason why you lost your job is because it's a structural reason. It's not because you were underperforming. It's not, you, it's, oh, I think it's totally okay to be honest about that. Okay? I think that there is more risk to lie and to say, I'm looking for a new job because I'm looking for greener pastures. Because HR folks are good investigators. They will find out about this at later on. Okay? And so if they find out about this, it will give them a tinge of doubt. Why did you have to lie about it? So just say it. I was redundated because the company had to do restructuring and I am still passionate in what I do and I'm looking for a company that can match those passions and values. Okay? Now, if you're being discriminated because you were redundated, I don't even think it's a company worth pursuing because they don't know how to measure and assess the talented employees. Okay. Okay, uh, here's one more question. How do you express assertiveness to clients without sounding rude, says user127 on TikTok. One way, without even changing your choice of words, is your voice. The deeper your voice sounds, the more commanding you look. That's one. Number two, when you're negotiating, do not speak too many words. Lesser words, better. Because it means that you are solid. You are assured of what you're saying. This is why if you keep on talking with a lot of adverbs, actually, basically, technically, assumingly, apparently, lots of adjectives and adverbs, it will make you sound less credible it will also make you le sound less commanding. So those alone, it will make you more assertive. Sometimes also, the best way to reject is to not give the reason immediately, especially when the reason is very obvious. So when you say, 
would you like to extend the deadline? So instead of saying no because blank, just say, nope, we will not extend the deadline. I see no reason why we should extend the deadline. That sounds more firm. And you don't need to be rude. You don't need to shout. You don't need to curse. But the way you express it shows command. Okay? Um, question here from TikTok. What is your advice to someone in his late 20s? Now you're making me feel old. Who's working in the corporate world experiencing a quarter life crisis? I am not credible to answer something like this because I haven't experienced it. Or maybe I've yet to experience it. I do, however, think that quarter life crisis happens when your expectations are not met according to the vision that you wanted to set for your career. So quarter life crisis happens or middle life crisis happens when X years ago, you wanted to be like this. You wanted to earn this much. You wanted to travel to this. You wanted to be in a relationship with this. But they are not being met and you cannot pinpoint the reason why. And this is backed up by a lot of studies, right? Most crises are because of unanswered questions that you want to answer. So my question here is, can you find a way to go back to your true north? And that is, sometimes this might sound geeky, but I would get a piece of paper or I will draw it on a whiteboard and I will map out the moment I started my career or when I was still in university or in high school, what were the top five things that I wanted to accomplish and I wanted to do? And are they possible to be accomplished versus the five things that I am possible able to enter in my career? Can I be X? Can I be Y? Can I be Z? And then ask yourself if you're going to be happy with that. Because at the end of the day, quarter life crisis is not about achieving success in your career. That is just a means to it. Ultimately, it's about happiness and quality of life. The ability to sleep at night. The ability to know that there is that you don't need abundance. You just need sufficiency in your life, for example. Okay? So ako, go back to your north. List it down. It's unfortunate I can't explain this quickly in a two-minute response. I don't think I'm giving justice to it. But the easiest thing that I can ask you is to go back and identify the X things that you want to accomplish and look for a career, if you're speaking about career, because we're in, this, we're in a session about career, that matches that. So don't look for a job. Look for a career. A job pays you without you liking it. A career not only pays you, but makes you happy and fulfilled with what you do. And that there is an upward progression to what you're doing. Okay? All right. Last three questions. Let's cover this. From Claire Balesteros. John, I would like to know how to approach an employee who is so smart during the interview, but her performance during her probationary period is really disappointing. That's ha this happens a lot. You know why? Some people are very eloquent and it masks their incompetency in real life. So before I answer this question, can I give you a moral lesson here? Do not determine someone's eligibility that they are competent to do the job just because of their English speaking skills. You have to add additional questions. You have to add case simulation questions in the job interview. Make them do the job. Make them craft PowerPoint slides. Make them craft situational spreadsheets. That's a better way to know if the person is worthy of being accepted. But number two, I will put this person, I will put this person in, in an improvement plan, a PIP. And I will tell them that there are res there are things that are not meeting up to expectations. It's a matter of confronting the person because if you don't tell it to them as early as you should, it gives them a wrong idea that they might be performing well, even if they're not. Okay, so I will use that same sandwich technique. I will share items that are worth praising. John, I appreciate X, Y, and Z. I've noticed you do X, Y, and Z. But there are things that I also want you to first meet in order for you to be eligible for the probation. And then I will share the negative part. 
This is important because I think most employees who are new are looking for appreciation and validation. And they need that extra oomph for them to be able to move on. So wag lang puro negative. You have to share the positive parts and then afterwards cover the negative parts. Okay? By the way, here's one tip. Huh? When you do that, do not spend too much time on the positive part to the point that it overpowers the negative part. Because they will keep on thinking, ah, okay naman pala ako. There are items that the company likes. So I, I think my bad sides are forgivable. So that's a big no-no. Spend a few moments only on the positive, but focus the entire time of the conversation on the negative that needs to be improved. Okay? Okay, last question. Ooh, I feel so bad with this question. What do you do when you don't have any trainings in your new job? You just don't know what to do. Oof, I made a lot of videos about this. What do you do if you have a mentor or a boss who doesn't want to mentor you? What do you do if you have a company that doesn't have a structure for training? So two things. Number one, embrace the fact that you have to do things on your own. You have to hustle. You have to train yourself by asking questions proactively from people in the company. Look at other senior leaders, look at your vendors and agencies, look at your other colleagues. And sometimes even if it irritates them, just go. As long as you're learning something from them and as long as they're not asking you to stop, keep on asking. We live in a world wherein you can learn a new course anywhere on YouTube, on TikTok, on Facebook. I would resort to learning more from those platforms. That's number two. Number three, when I do my performance appraisal meetings, I will call out that if ever I am ranked and scored low for my results, I will call out also that it's because the training was not provided properly. Okay? I need to hold my company accountable because something has to give. If you're not giving me proper training, I will not be able to give my best. Also, I will not wait for the end of the year to say this. I'm going to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with my manager immediately. I'm also going to ask my other colleagues if they are experiencing the same thing. Because sometimes you need to validate, ikaw lang ba ang tinitreat na ganyan? Right? So you have to ask, oh, Joanna, can I ask, is it really normal that in this company there is no proper training? You have to be left things on your own? What did you do? Is it okay with the other employees as well? So you need to call these things out. Okay? Silent treatment is the least that I want you to do in this approach. You can keep on being silent, but you also don't have the right to complain because you're not doing anything about it. Okay? I would love to answer your questions more. We'll do that tomorrow. We'll do another live session. But for now, I need to give away our prize from our sponsor, and that is Osh, or Oh So Healthy Snacks. Can I get a letter O as in Oh So Healthy if you guys are ready for this? We would like to give 500 pesos worth of gift certificates from Osh. I will only select one winner. It can either be from TikTok, it can be from Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube. So these are fun flavored snacks. You can see this in grocery stores. You can also see them in Starbucks and in Coffee Bean at times. Okay? These are fun flavored snacks made out of dried fruits and vegetables. They are baked, not fried. They're also gluten free. Adiba? You know, by the way, what's my dream job? I haven't done this. I've done it for a few hostings. But sometimes my dream job is to become a voiceover for a product. I think I can do a good job. Or, oh my gosh, this is a dream job. I want to do, I want to be a voice actor for an anime. Because I love watching anime. Like, kung merong, if there's a Filipino or English dub for Demon Slayer, or for Jujutsu Kaisen. I would love to do that. Okay. Uh, I'm digressing. Go back now. So my question is this. You guys are ready? Give me a letter R if you guys are ready. I'll be asking a question now. If you get this right, you'll be able to get the 500 peso gift certificate. Okay. My question is this. It's, again, another trivia question. I love trivia questions. Uh, when I was in high school, I joined Digital LG Quiz at GMA7 and even went far as quarterfinals, by the way. Okay, this was a question asked during our round. Question is this, 
what is the most used vegetable in the world? Most used and most consumed. What would that be? Okay, while we're waiting for your answer, Stan, Jero, come here. Let's show your face. Let's select a winner. What is the most used vegetable in the world? Let me look at the chat box now. Okay, guys, paunahan to, ah. It's the first person who gets this correct. And sorry, this one's only eligible to folks who are in the Philippines. So the correct answer, ladies and gentlemen, is it's not tomato. It's not tomato. The correct answer, my winner. The name is Dizon Gale. Dizon Gale. You're the first one across all the chat boxes. The correct answer is it's the onion, which is also my favorite vegetable. Very versatile. Salads to uh, stews to wraps, everything. So uh, Gale Dizon, if that's your complete name. Would, could you please send us a private message so I can send to you instructions on how to claim your prize? Congratulations. Okay. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for joining us. I had so much fun answering your questions today. And we'd love to see you tomorrow. Um, maybe I'll go online, I don't know, maybe 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock. I don't know. I know I have a dinner tomorrow. I'll just find a way. Or maybe on Saturday, we'll, we'll find a way. Okay. So stay safe. Have a, for folks in the Philippines, have a great long weekend and continue learning. The world is your oyster. Bye, guys.